rest of us, grab your Bibles. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah. It's in the Old Testament. And uh, we're going to be in chapter 1 of the book of Isaiah. Before we look into this scripture, let me just kind of give you context for where we are here. Remember, the book of Isaiah is a book of prophecy. So Isaiah was a prophet. So this book is a prophetic book. And some of his prophecies are dealing with Israel at that moment for what Israel was dealing with at that moment. But scattered in the book of Isaiah is what we call some messianic prophecies. It doesn't mean they're messy prophecies. That was funny. They're messianic prophecies. In other words, they're prophecies about the Messiah because Isaiah was looking forward toward the Messiah. We today are looking backward toward the Messiah who we know as Jesus of Nazareth, right? So in this in our text this morning, we're looking at a prophecy about the coming Messiah. And when we read this, it's actually gonna be written from the first person as if the Messiah, who we know is Jesus, is saying, is, is, is saying these words, okay? So we're gonna start reading in verse one of Isaiah 61, and think of this, Jesus speaking from the first person. Here's our passage. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, For the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. What kind of news? He sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of God's favor has come and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. Come on now. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes and joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for whose glory? For his own glory. Let's pray, ready? Lord, we love your word. I pray that your living and active word would be living and active in us this morning. This morning, Holy Spirit, bring revelation as we look into your word. Teach us, move us along on our discipleship path this morning. In Jesus' name, and everybody said. In this passage, it kind of gives what I call the, um, the mission statement for the Messiah. One of my favorite books in the world is Stephen Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Anybody ever read that book? Great book. One of Stephen Covey's habits is begin with the end in mind. So what we see is Jesus is kind of beginning beginning here with the end in mind. In other words, this is what I have come to do. So this is the Messiah saying, this is what I'm going to be about. This was his mission statement. And in this, what we see is the goodness of our Father. It, he's, he's sending his son, the Messiah. What is he doing? He's sending his son to bring good news to the poor, to comfort those who, are mourn, who mourn, to set captives free. God just came to do good things for us, church. In the same way that we want good things for our children, how many of you want your children to be healthy and fulfilled? I was about to say happy, but you know, happiness is fleeting. How many of you want your kids to be healthy and fulfilled? And that, it, that God wants the same thing for us, church. That's why those songs blessed me so much because we serve a good father and he wants good things for us. Next week, um, we're gonna have a guest speaker. He's a friend of mine um, from Pennsylvania and um, he's got an interesting story. I'm not sure how much he'll share with you, but um, I was talking to him this week, and, and in order to get the graphics right for his message, I said, I need you to send me the title of your message and like a sentence or two just describing what you're going to be speaking about. And here, here's the sentence he sent me. Ready? Is that we are sons and daughters of a father who's better than we think he is. And I'm like, ooh, that's beautiful. So that's what we're going to be dealing with next week. But in this text, we see that just God wants good things for his people. Our series is freedom. What God wants for his kids is for us to walk in freedom, in wholeness, in health, in spiritual health, in, 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 in health in our soul, health in our bodies. God just wants good things for us. 
Now, something happened a couple years ago in our church um, that's been progressing is that we have accidentally, I guess, we have actually developed a community of people in, you know, the tribe within our tribe. There's a certain tribe, and this is a tribe around the sport of triathlons. <laughs> Obviously, I'm the poster child for, for fitness, but we, we actually have this community in our church of triathletes. Not only do we have triathletes, we have some triathlete coaches Charles Macadon and Mike Martinez. These guys coach. I didn't even know that was a thing. I thought like to coach a triathlete, you just go run faster, pedal harder, you know, swim. Fa- I don't know. But I mean, it's, it's a real thing. And, and I didn't realize it. And I mean, these guys really, they'll get you in shape, you know. But we have this, um, we have this, this community of triathletes. And, um, you know, in, in the American culture, there, there's already built in the American culture that women shave their legs. Men, can we just thank the women in the room for shaving, for shaved legs? I, again, I thought that was going to get a bigger, bigger response. I'm just, ladies, thank you. That just makes life better. Rubbing legs in the bed with a woman who doesn't have legs like mine. So it's like in our, in our culture, we have women who shave their legs, but in the triathlon culture, the men shave their legs too. Now listen to me. They, they'll want you to think that the reason they do, listen, the reason men shave their legs is, is what they're trying to do is minimize resistance like when you're swimming. Now, here's my question to you. Of all the triathletes in the room and all the guys you coach, Mike and, and Charles, how many of you compete at such a high level that the drag of the hair on your legs in the, in the pool would make a difference between first and second place? Coach Charles, that's you. I love it, brother. I love it. So they want us to think what they're doing is, is minimizing resistance and maximizing efficiency, right? Now, what it really is, come on, let's be honest. It just looks good. <laughs> Listen, if you're a wife and your husband is a triathlete, please just, in his ear right now, just whisper, baby, your legs look great. <laughs> just stroke his ego. The reason I, I'm laughing about this is because there was actually a time in my life where I rode bikes and I ran a lot and I shaved my legs and it was just because I thought it looked good honestly I was just, I was just trying to impress Laurie just trying to hang on to her you know and so anyway but the idea was again minimize resistance maximize efficiency for the race well you know Paul equated our Christian walk with a race and and so in the same way that these triathletes are running races you and I are running a race and guess what God wants for us is to minimize the resistance in our life and to maximize our efficiency so that we can be all that he has called us to be and we can run our race in freedom church he wants us free because the end goal remember our text is what we want is to be our our life to, to be represented by an oak tree stability and fruitful all for the glory of God so that when, when the world looks at our life, they would see the goodness of God in the fact that our Father has been so kind to us and has given us freedom, made freedom available to us, and then through the process of being discipled and growing in our faith, we experience more and more freedom and more and more efficiency as we run our race all to the glory of God. So this, this series on freedom is really about you and I getting rid of the hair on our legs or whatever it is that is, 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 would add to the resistance in our walk. And so this morning I wanna, I wanna talk with you about this subject. And you know, you can't run effectively and efficiently your race if you're burdened down and one of the things that weighs us down, church, is our past. 
It's our past that weighs us down. We love Jesus, we're born again, we're in this thing, but there are things from our past that are hindering our walk and we need to shed those things to minimize resistance, maximize efficiency so that we can be all that God has called us to be. God wants us free, church. And he wants us free from our past, but this is very real. This is a very real thing that our past affect us. You know, hurts and, and, and things that cling on to us from the past, they affect our lives. I do some marriage counseling and what I've discovered in marriage counseling is there are principles that make a marriage work. I mean, people come in and I hear their story, but what I know is if we can, whatever your story is, if I can overlay these principles of marriage over your marriage, you're gonna be okay because there are principles that make a marriage work. And it almost always worked. You know the one time where I find the challenge, even if people apply their principles, is, is when there's hurts from the past. You know, one of the principles of marriage is that the job of us husbands is to love our wives as Christ loved the church. I have fallen in love with that. Because here's what I know. Your wife will never be happier than if you begin to love her like Jesus loved the church. How did he love the church? He put a towel around himself, got down on his knees and washed their feet. Servant leadership. Eventually, what did he do? He laid his life down for his wife. Let me tell you, you want to make your wife grin? Love her like Jesus loves the church. So there's the principle. So most times when a man begins to love his wife like Jesus did, you'll find that it'll heal the church. You know the caveat though? You know when it doesn't work? It doesn't work when there's past, when there's hurts from the past in the wife. You know, the husband, I coach him up. Like, hey, with your words, begin to bless your wife. With your words, begin to express how much value you place in her. Tell her she's beautiful. Tell her she's competent at motherhood. Tell her she's this. Tell her she's a good cook. Whatever you got to tell her, just start telling her. And so a, a man will begin to bless his wife with his words, but you know what? If from the past she feels no value, and if she doesn't have any self-worth, and from pains in her past she struggles with her own self-identity, you know what? All the encouragement from her husband will run up against nothing if the hurts from her past. I've had husbands tell me, I tell my wife she's beautiful and she doesn't want to hear it. And I think, what kind of woman wouldn't want to hear that? But if you struggle with your own self-worth, you see what I'm saying? Hurts from the past can affect every, every area of our life. So church, we have to get healed from those hurts. You know, again, the way we were raised and the things that happened to us, they they affect us. And and, and there are people in here in this room today who really from our past, we've got serious injuries, things that have happened to us. And like I said last week, on behalf of God and his church, I wanna tell you, I'm sorry that happened to you. I wish it wouldn't have happened to you, but it did. And there are people who really struggle with the past. And you know, the problem though, is we were discussing this as a, um, as a staff this week is the symptoms of brokenness in an individual are often off-putting. Like the symptoms are ugly and off-putting. Think about that guy on the corner begging for your money at the stop sign. I mean, this is blue collar sulfur. What's our thought? Get a job, right? But he's out there begging, begging for money and and we tend to look at him and go, come on, what's wrong with this dude? Why doesn't he have a job? But what we don't understand is the brokenness in him. And we tend to look at people, we look at the addict and go, just quit doing drugs. What we don't understand is there's brokenness in them and there's pain behind all that. And let me tell you, church, we Christians aren't always good at at, at empathizing with people like that. We get judgmental and we get critical and we say, well, just stop doing this. So we can get judgmental, but you know what? Listen to me carefully, carefully listen to what I'm about to say. I think God looks at it differently. 
Because when God looks down at people in their sin, he doesn't go, well, come on, guys, I wish you would just get it together. Instead, God understands the hurt behind the behavior. He understands the patterns. He understands the brokenness. I mean, imagine, imagine that woman who sells her body for a living and the Christian's looking at her going, why didn't she just stop this? Now, how many of you think we need to stop behavior like that? Sin is never okay. This is not an excuse to remain in bad behavior, but we Christians sometimes look at it and go, why didn't she just stop that? Here's what I believe God does is he looks down from heaven and him outside of time just doesn't see a woman who's using her body for a living. What he sees is a little girl that was hurt and that ugly things were said to her or damage done to her. He looks back and he sees the pain behind the behavior and he's way more gracious and way more kind than we can offer muster. And he looks at that. And God doesn't want us to just change our behavior. He wants to heal the hurt that causes the behavior. See, God works from the inside out. Now, again, I'm not excusing sin. Even we said this last week, if you're here and you're in some sort of addiction, as much as God loves you, you may be doing damage to your life in your addiction. So we want to get rid of the sin as soon as possible. But God wants to deal with the hurt and the pain behind it. He wants us free from our past so that we can run the race that he has for us and reach our full potential in his kingdom. But again, sometimes the symptoms of people, people's sin, it's just off-putting. And we, we tend to move away from people like that. You know, that, that guy begging for money on the corner, what we know is, let's say $100 would solve today's crisis guess what? There's another crisis coming tomorrow. In their life, they live from crisis to crisis to crisis. And again, we can get ugly with them and just go get a job. And, and how many of you think they need a job? They do. But there's things in them that need to be healed. And we need to be gracious and kind as God does his healing work because I also have things in me that need to be healed. And I want God to be gracious in me as I'm working through my stuff, Right? And I'm so thankful for organizations in our town, you know, like SC3. How many of you know and love Ms. Paula Taylor and SC3? <laughs> love her. In fact, um, SC3 is, is, is one of our monthly missions. We as a church support them monthly financially, um, along we, we do the same with Care Help in the way of, I mean, we have global missions, but we do some things that reach directly into our community. And so we... We support those ministries, but I remember a few years back, SC3 had a conference they wanted to hold, and so we actually let them use our building, and they, they held a, a conference here for ministries like themselves that, that dealt with people in their brokenness, and they had speakers come from all over the country, and these guys were talking about the psychology behind it. They were talking about people trapped in cycles of poverty. And again, we just want to say to them, be a better money manager or get a job or whatever, but we don't understand that their, their mind is actually broken. I don't say that, that so that they can be bums the rest of their life. I'm just saying we need healing, church. The prostitute needs healing. The addict needs healing. The poor person needs healing. The plant worker needs healing. The teacher needs healing. We all need healing, church, because we don't want our past to dictate our future. We can't run our race while carrying all this. And so we, I love these ministries that work with people. But again, sometimes we think because of those extreme examples that I don't have any work to do here. I want you to know, church, you got some work to do in your own yard. But here's what I want to say to you. With all sincerity, I believe as believers, we need to prioritize the healing of our soul in our walk with God. There are those of you hit, sitting here this morning who your life, you can see the series of, 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 of events and, and just the dysfunction and the brokenness. And I hope there's somebody sitting here today who says, you know, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of going from brokenness to brokenness, crisis to crisis, failure to failure, broken relationship after broken relationship. I hope there's somebody who's sick of, of that cycle and is ready to do something different. 
And if that's the case, here's what we need to do. We need to prioritize our own personal healing. God, free me from my past. And there's ways of doing that. First of all, just being here and being at a church where the word is preached is, is gonna be part of your healing process. Hey, go hang around some people who are healthier than you are. And we're a discipleship church. Find somebody who will disciple you, somebody who's a little healthier than you are, and go talk to them. Get a tribe of people around you who will pray with you, who will show you how to get in the word, who will walk you through these things. This is, that's how we get healed from our past. But there's other ways too. You know, some of us may need a more intentional process and, and this is when I appreciate certain ministries in the body of Christ. Y'all okay with what I'm doing so far? We good? Just thinking about um, Philip and Cassie Fontenot. They have a ministry called Kingdom Life and Philip and Cassie with Miss Jill Midkiff and some of their other team, you know what they do? They take people and walk them through their brokenness dealing with your past so if you have hurts and scars that are affecting your life today that you're ready to be freed from so that you can run your race you may want to go talk to Philip and Cassie I love uh, Crossroads Church in Moss Bluff uh, Pastor Terry and Sharon Artisan How, don't we love those guys I don't know if you know them but they're great church great people Miss Sharon oozes sweetness I mean it's almost nauseating you know it's a she is the sweetest person I've ever met. They have a ministry called Beth Shalom where they'll walk you through healing. So, so it, it may be that you can just find a, a person in the body to walk with you. It may be that you need to find one of these other ministries, but let me just press on you, church. We all need to get healed from our past so that we can go on and be that oak tree for the glory of God. Because listen, it doesn't just affect you, it affects your children. It affects your grandchildren. How many of you could say, I want a lineage handed down to my kids that, was, that is better than the one that was handed to me? Anybody want to change something about your family line? I just want to encourage you, church. The heart of God, the reason he sent Jesus was to bring us into freedom. We need to, in our Christian walk, prioritize the healing process. Now, this morning... For our purposes here today, I want to deal with, we can't, we can't deal with the whole subject of healing, but I want to walk you through personally, if you need healing, if you're ready to get free from your past, what I consider to be the first step in the healing processes in a lot of people's cases. And I want to talk to you about freedom through forgiveness. The subject of forgiveness. Whenever I talk to people about forgiveness, I, um, I equate unforgiveness, carrying unforgiveness like carrying a 30-pound stone. You know, we talked about the hair on your legs slowing you down in a triathlon. How about trying to run a triathlon carrying a 30-pound stone? If we're going to talk about minimizing resistance and maximizing efficiency, you cannot run your race while you are carrying unforgiveness. And the first part, the first step in your healing may be the act of forgiveness. So I want to talk to you this morning about forgiveness in, in two different categories, okay? First of all, I'm going to talk about what I call unilateral forgiveness and then transactional forgiveness, okay? So let's start with unilateral forgiveness. Jody, what are you talking about? Unilateral forgiveness is this idea, you know, it takes two people to have conflict, right? But a unilateral forgiveness is when one piece, one half of that equation, one person decides to forgive. The other person is not involved for various reasons, but one person decides to forgive. Now, there, there could be several reasons why you would exercise or you would operate in unilateral forgiveness. One could be that the offense that happened was just so, it was just so light and so incidental that you decide, I'm just gonna let that go. But here's the next reason is, is, is I believe more along the lines of what most people deal with, is that the person who offended you, the, perp the person who perpetrated, violated you, they are, for whatever reason, either unable 
are unwilling to forgive. Let's say that the that, that you were something happened to you, you were injured, and you've been carrying this stone of unforgiveness and, and that hurt from your past is hindering your future. What do you do about it? Well, you make a unilateral decision. In other words, the other person is involved in this. This is just me. My decision is I choose forgiveness. And the reason it has to be unilateral is because maybe the person who offended you is unable to engage in the transaction. Now, why would he or she be un, unable? Well, it may be that that person's dead. It, uh, there are probably people sitting in this room who someone violated you, some of you in very serious ways, and that person is now dead. Listen to me, church. If you don't get free from that, that person will still be controlling you from his grave. He or she, they may be in a prison somewhere in a different state, no contact with you. From their prison cell, they're still controlling your life. It may be that it's a father who disappeared. He walked out and you've not heard from him. You don't even know where he is on this planet we call earth, but he or she, whoever they are, they are controlling you today because of this. We've heard it said that unforgiveness is like me drinking poison and expecting it to hurt you. Church, your father loves you too much for you to be bound by unforgiveness. Here's what the word tells us in Colossians 3, 13. It says, make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. If the hurt that was perpetrated against you is really deep, you read that verse and you say, how cruel is God? How cruel of God to require me to forgive someone who hurt me in such a deep way? You're seeing it wrong, church. This isn't cruel. This is the most loving thing your father can do for you. What he's saying is don't let that thing control you. This thing affected you and it's affected your life, but don't let it affect you into perpetuity. Let's get rid of this thing. Instruction is to forgive. Sometimes the person who violated us, though, they're not even around anymore. They're unable to interact in forgiveness. Or they may be unwilling. And I know a lot of you, this is painful because sometimes the people who hurt you, they, they, won't, even, they won't even acknowledge that, that there's been an injustice. And I know people who live through that. It's just the family secret. And nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to hear about it. And here you are, you're trapped, you've been hurt. And that unforgiveness is building up on the inside of you. Church, listen to me. Because you have been forgiven, you now have the ability to forgive. Did you deserve the forgiveness God gave you? Everybody in the room answer that question right now. We didn't. So in the same way, God is calling us to forgive other people. It's not about them, it's about us. It's about us walking in freedom. So I want to say to you, if you've been injured, whatever, whatever the severity, we've all been injured, but whatever the severity level, even if the other person is not even aware that you've been hurt or they're unable or unwilling to engage you, church, you need to forgive. And we need to release this thing because this is going to be step one in your personal healing. This is going to be you shaving your legs so you can swim faster. That's what this thing's going to do. So, great theory. It doesn't mean that what they did was okay. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that it wasn't a big deal. Listen, it was wrong. It was a big deal. But it doesn't matter. This is about getting free, church. This is about getting free. And so how do you do this? If, if unilateral forgiveness is so powerful, how do you do it? Let me coach you through it. You ready? We said that unforgiveness is like a rock. So the act of forgiving, you know what the act of forgiving is? Is I make a choice to put this rock down. That's it. I make a choice. Now here's, if you forgive this morning, here's what I hope happens. I hope you get goosebumps from your head to your toes. I hope the heavens open and angels sing. I really hope that happens. But guess what? If it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Because forgiveness is not a feeling, it's a choice. 
And all you're doing is say, I'm not carrying around. I am tired of trying to run my race carrying a 30 pound rock. I am putting this thing down for my sake, for my kid's sake, for my future's sake, for my God's sake. The act of forgiveness is just making a choice. It's just that simple. But here's where it gets tricky, right? Because simple doesn't mean easy. So it's simple. But here's, here's, here's how it usually goes, though. Let's say you've been carrying unforgiveness around for 20 years. And your daily routine is this. Your alarm goes off in the morning. You grab a cup of coffee. Then you get dressed for, for work. You get dressed for your day. And right before you walk out the door, you reach down and you pick up this 30-pound rock and you go about your day. That's what you've been doing for 20 years. That's your routine, right? Coffee, clothes, rock. Coffee, clothes, rock. There's your rut. All of a sudden, though, you come to church and Jody preaches an amazing message. <laughs> and you've decided it's time for you to forgive. We, in our time of ministry, you, you forgive and goosebumps and angels sing and unicorns appear. The whole thing happens, right? Let me, let me tell you what's gonna happen tomorrow morning when that alarm goes off and you drink that coffee and you put on those clothes and you head for that door. When you get to that door, the devil's gonna tap you on the shoulder and say, don't forget your rock. And when that happens, people think, I'm supposed to forgive and forget, so I guess I really didn't forgive. Listen, that whole forgive and forget thing is a lie. Forget, forget and forgive. That was a slick pun, right? It's not about forgetting, right? It's about a, an act of your will. But what's gonna happen is you go to walk out that door free because I got set free and I've forgiven and you're heading out that door and the enemy's like, hey, uh, don't forget your rock. So do you have to re-forgive? No, no, no. All you have to do is reaffirm that you have forgiven. You just need to tell the devil, I won't be toting that around today. I won't be toting that around today. And it may be that on your way to work, you're driving in the car and you have that feeling, oh my gosh, I forgot something. And the enemy's like, yeah, you forgot the rock. And you just have to tell them, no, 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 they're still forgiven. And you may have to do that every day for six months. I know that gets you excited. You may have to do that every day for six months. Eventually, you'll get past it. But here, church, this is what I want you to know. All you got to do is reaffirm it. I'm not picking that rock up again. I'm not. It may be a weekday where you reach down and you grab it and you're about halfway up and you say, nope, not putting that, picking that rock up. It's just a decision we make, church. If you want to be free, you got to put that rock down. So the first area of forgiveness is unilateral forgiveness. The second area would be transactional forgiveness. In other words, at this point, I want there to be forgiveness because I'm trying to maintain the relationship. Can, can I go back to unilateral, just a thought on unilateral really quick. Listen to me, church. Just because you forgive doesn't mean you trust. The person you've forgiven, you probably don't need to get in a business deal with them again. You probably don't need to give them the pin to your debit card. You probably don't need to let them babysit your children yet. But what the enemy will do will tell you, well, if you don't trust him, you didn't really forgive him. No, no, no. Separate trust from forgiveness. Forgiveness has, I mean, trust has to be earned. Forgiveness is given. And one of my favorite sayings is, trust is gained in drops and lost in buckets. You ever heard that? And so it may take a while for trust to build up again. Forgiveness is, is just a choice, Right? But in transactional forgiveness now, I want there to be forgiveness because I'm trying to salvage the relationship. I value the relationship, and so I want forgiveness to happen. You know, where, you know where the most beautiful expression of this is? Is in a Christian's life with repentance. How many of you just love the Lord so much that you're eager to repent because I don't want anything separating the relationship between me and my father? When I sin, whether intentionally or accidentally, I go to him in repentance. Why? Because I value the relationship. I gotta keep this thing intact. I don't want anything between me and my God. That's, that's the most beautiful expression of transactional forgiveness. But there's also 
relationships in our life, whether it's family and probably family and church are the most prominent two gatherings of people in this subject. Some of you, there's, there's offenses in your family and you love these people and you want a relationship with them. And so in transactional uh, uh, forgiveness is when we follow Jesus' words in Matthew 18, 15. It says, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens, listens and confesses, you have won that person back. So Jesus is saying, if you're holding unforgiveness against someone with whom you want to have a relationship, you need to go to them. You need to go to them and, and, and ask for forgiveness or, or tell them they are forgiven. You need to interact with this person. But this is where it gets dangerous, church. Because some of you are going to get fired up and go, yeah, you know what? I have been wanting to forgive oh so and so. I'm going to take Jody's advice. I'm going to set an appointment. And we go in, guns a blazing, come in red hot. I have chosen to forgive you for your many iniquities against me. And we're expecting that person to fall down in tears and yes, thank you so much for your, your love and mercy. No, no, no. The Bible tells us, especially in the body of Christ or in our families, if you got ought against your brother, you got to go make it right. In fact, and, and this was challenging to me as I was studying this, you know the scripture actually says that when you go, when you're at church and you go to pay your tithes or give an offering, when you, if you're about to give your offering and you remember that you've got something against a brother, leave your offering and go get it right before you even give your offering. Can I say something to you that's not funny, church? I want that to be the heart of Victory Worship Center where I, we are more interested in unity in relationships than money. We will forfeit the money, but we will salvage the relationships. So if you're here today and you got ought against your brothers, hang on to your tithes, hang on to, and I mean that sincerely, go make it right with your brother because we don't want that kind of stuff in our body. Transactional relationship is when we go to the person that's violated us or we've had conflict with, but the key to this, right? So the key to doing this is a spirit of humility. It's a spirit of humility. The same way I go to God in repentance, in humility, God, I blew it. And I don't deserve this, but I'm asking for it. We go with that same spirit of humility to our brother. Listen, your body posture, your tone, your inflection, everything comes into this. What you want to communicate to that person is I love you and I cannot stand anything in between this relationship and it is worth anything to have you, to have restoration in our relationship. I love you that much. Would you please forgive me? Or can I have your forgiveness? You understand? So if we're going to do the transactional forgiveness it has to be done in the correct spirit because here an, another quote for you ready nobody learns when they're defensive you go at somebody on blast and and you're not going to do any good but with a spirit of humility we go to one another and we ask for reconciliation church this is so important churches divide every day because of conflict and unforgiveness and so, may it not be so here among us amen and you know can I say to you Sometimes we church people too, we specialize in offense. We're just looking for, for, for offense. And guess what? If you're looking for offense, you will find it. I promise, I may have offended you already. My wife, who is a saint, might offend you, especially if you're looking for it. Can we decide that as a church, we're not carrying in a spirit of offense? There are some of you, you left the last church because you were offended. Guess what? You're probably going to leave this church because you're offended, and you're going to go to the next one, and you're going to go to the First Baptist Church, First Methodist Church, First Pentecostal Church, First Catholic Church, First Presbyterian Church, and you're going to get offended at every one until you finally realize that the problem is I carry a spirit of offense, and I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not going to let the enemy isolate me. I want to be part of this body. I value this body. 
So I'm going to walk in forgiveness. I'm going to forgive those who offended me. I'm going to ask forgiveness quickly for those who I offend. But I want to walk in freedom. So I hope you've heard my heart here this morning. Church, what we want to do is minimize the resistance, walk in freedom to minimize the resistance so that we can maximize our efficiency as we run this race for God's glory. There's a heart of a father looking down, says, I want my people free. I want my kids free. And those hurts from the past, injuries, and again, we could talk for hours on this of what those injuries are. I don't know. I know they're vast, but what we can't have is injuries from the past past affecting our future. We need to get free from this. So we need to prioritize healing. I just want you in your personal life, please prioritize getting healed from your past. This morning we've dealt with probably step one in getting healed from your past and that's dealing with forgiveness. So here's how I want to finish our time here. Would you do me a favor and just take everything off your lap and stay seated? Just take everything off your lap and I'd like for you to bow your head with me. Just just every head bowed and every eye closed. And I wanna ask you a question. Don't, Don't answer it yet until I tell you to. How many of you, by raising your hand here in just a minute, would tell me or, or who, would, who would acknowledge the fact that I have been hurt in my life and there are hurts that have been dragging on me and they are truly weighing me down and hurting, hurting my ability to run my race. Just for my own edification with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you, would you please lift your hand? I see that, beautiful. Okay, put your, put your hands down. This is your morning. This is your morning. Here's what I want to do. First of all, I want to deal with this in a unilateral forgiveness way. I'm going to lead you in a prayer in a minute. And what we're going to do is, we're, you can look up at me. We're just going to make a choice. We're going to exercise our free will. And we're going to forgive those who perpetrated, those who've hurt us. Listen to me, church. Please listen to me carefully. It doesn't mean it was right. It doesn't mean it's okay. It doesn't mean they deserve it. It doesn't mean any of that. None of that comes into the equation. The one thing that comes into the equation is I want to walk in the freedom that God has promised me. That's all we're doing. So I want to lead you in a prayer. And we're just going to make that choice through prayer to forgive that person. Now, Monday morning... You're going to have to do what I told you to do. You're going to have to refuse to pick that rock up. It may be before you get out of this building, you're going to have to make a choice. I'm not picking that rock up anymore. Listen, that father who walked out on you, you're going to have to release him. That mother who hurt you, you're going to have to release him. That person who spoke ugly words over you, you're going to have to release him. Come on, that's not your truth. That's not your truth. Those words aren't your truth. You've got another voice. There's another voice who's saying you have value. You have worth. I believe in you. I love you. I've got good things for you. Which voice are we going to believe? We got to let those old voices go. Our hope for our future is in releasing the past. I want to walk you through this prayer and then we're going to help one another walk it out in the future. Get you a friend who will call you tomorrow and go, did you pick up the rock? Right? So, again, now bow your heads again. And if you need to forgive, let me just walk you through this prayer. Under, under your breath, would you pray this prayer with me? Say, Lord Jesus, I choose to forgive blank. Name them under your breath. I choose to forgive them for blank for what they did those actions, those words, whatever it is. I want you to just tell God, Lord, I choose to forgive them. And I'm putting down the rock and I release them whether they deserve it or not. As an act of my will, I release them right now in Jesus' name. Now look up at me. If you just did that, church, you're free. You're free. Don't pick it up again. Don't let the enemy trick you back into bondage into carrying weights that you can't run with. You're free. You're free. 
Can I pray for you now, Lord? For every person who just prayed that prayer, I thank you for the grace to walk it out. I thank you for the grace to not pick up that stone again. We tell the voice of the enemy that would like to trick them back into bondage. We silence your voice in Jesus' name. And Lord, I thank you for the grace, the power, the authority to continue to walk through, to walk in forgiveness in Jesus' name. Now, Lord, I pray over our body. Lord, may you give us the grace to be forgiving and releasing one another from from conflict, from damages, from things that happen in our family. Lord, I don't want our families divided. I don't want our church family divided. Lord, show us how to walk in forgiveness so that the enemy can't drive wedges and separate people and families and churches. In Jesus' name, I want you to all pray this prayer out loud with me. You ready? Every voice in the room. Say, in Jesus' name, I will not walk with the spirit of offense from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you excited about this? I love it.